Hey, Coach Gloves here, and today we're going to be talking about what level you should have your mix peaking at. Does it even matter what level it peaks out? What about the RMS value? Isn't that important? This crest factor thing we just got done talking about. What's the deal with this DBFS? What's all this stuff? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to assume you know what DBFS is, DB full scale. If you don't, check out my digital audio basic series. I try to remember to put a link in the description and it will take you there and you can learn about DBFS and what that means. So let's go ahead and talk about what level your mix should be peaking at. Well, we have this DBFS scale right here. You generally want your mix peaking at six. Now let's go to the, there's, there's this very, very opinionated though. And that's the negative six DBFS is what people are going to be telling you. Even if they don't know what the junk they're doing. That's just like the answer everyone says. Cause that's what they've been told. Like when I was brand new, I was able to say that answer to someone who was going to hire me for a job. And like, I didn't know very much at the time. That's what I said. And he was like, that's right. And so it gave him some faith in me. So he hired me. So it's literally like, if you're going to say an answer, that's like your safe answer. But there's some, let's look at this from a little bit more of an educated standpoint now. So some people are going to mix it zero. Okay. There are special reasons why you would do this. One of them is maybe you are doing some sort of a concept, some sort of, it's a, you're an artistic endeavor. You're going to be like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out really soft and I'm going to get louder and louder and louder. And then this one spot, my track, it's going to crescendo all up to this one spot. And then I'm going to call it good. Another reason is some people like to mix as if it was their master. So they'll have their stuff up there as if they're, it was mastered and then they'll mix it so that they know exactly what it's going to sound like. There's no mastering to be involved here. This is a problem because let's say that you're, do you're doing your mix and you know, it's really freaking loud. You may never realize that your hi-hats have been covered up as much as they have, or you may never realize you may want your kick to pop out a little bit more and you can't go anywhere. You can't go above zero in the digital realm. It's impossible. So, well, it's possible, but the results change dramatically when you cross that line. So the, you, you, you're faced with this conundrum of like, I have no headroom. I have literally no room to do this. So what you do is you mix to a lower level. That way you have headroom. So that's one reason why you'd mix to a lower level is you'd mix to negative six DBFS so that later on when you're mixing and you want your kick to be a little bit louder, you know, you push it up like half a DB, just, just a little bit. And it makes it come through. Maybe when you're mixing it first against the bass and the drum and you're mixing it in the context of the drum set, you're like, Hey, this sounds really good. But as soon as you toss on your, your pad synths and your lead synths and your atmospheric synths, which I guess I'm classifying separate from pads in this case, then then all of a sudden it's having a little bit of a hard time. So, you know, you do some side chaining and whatnot, but still not happening. So you just turn it up a little bit and bang, problem solved versus like before you had nowhere to go. You were freaking stuck. So that's one reason. And this gets into mixing at lower levels. Now you got to remember digital has an incredibly low noise floor, like incredibly low. So some people will mix at a lower level and then start peaking at a lower level and work their way up. So they'll start at negative 18 decibels. I know that sounds really low and it sounds crazy, but you can totally do it. If you have pristine recordings, you can do it. Most people will start at like nine or 12 and you can work your way up to a level. That way, as you're mixing, you want to be careful about turning your volume up. Like you're going to be aiming, like you're going to shoot for nine. You should just shoot for nine. But if it creeps up a little bit, don't worry. If you find yourself constantly creeping up, then you're making, then your decisions are being based way more on loudness. You should probably just turn your volume knob up and that, call that good. But anyways, you're mixing. What you'll start is you'll start at nine. You say, oh, my kick needs to come out a little bit more. You poop, you poop it up a little bit more and bang, you're like problem solved and you're good to go. So you're above what you were going to peak at. So what? You're still below negative six. So you still have room. You want to be, you can achieve a crappy crest factor though, because as soon as you get rid of all this, so this is the headroom, right? The distance between the zero and the, and the nine, this distance, if you truly peak, if your loudest signal is at nine, you close all this distance. And so your track's going to sound way louder than it did before. Right. But if you have big variations in your mix, as far as volume is concerned, you're still not going to have a very good crest factor when you get rid of that headroom. So you're going to need to compensate for that in your mix. So that's another thing about the mix is it's, it's deceptive in the way that this is done. This does not mean you will get an incredibly loud mix just because you mix to negative six doesn't mean squat. If you have a large dynamic range, you're still going to be crushing it. And that's something that when I, the first time I did this, I got a mix that I really, really, really liked. But when I turned it up, it wasn't as impactful as others because they were on average louder, 
but I was like, I didn't understand. I was like, but my mix, I did the, the mix thing correctly. And then I understood, oh, oh, I, I still have all this dynamic range, which is good. That's what I wanted my song to have. So you know what I did? I lived with it. I liked the dynamic range. So what? Mine didn't sound as like crazy as like a banger as like someone else's tune. Mine had way more dynamic range. If you turned mine up, mine would sound way better than if you turned theirs up by like a lot. So I was like, okay, cool. And so that's, that's what I lived with. But other times now I'll mix and try to get that really loud sound so that if you're listening at a lower volume, mine would sound, you know, much more aggressive and edgy than someone else's. And that's typically where consumers leave their volume is at the one spot that their favorite track is at. And so you're kind of stuck if you can't compete with wherever that same volume is. So that's another thing you may consider releasing special special mixes of your music that have been mixed to be perfectly the way you want. All that's required is that you turn the volume up a little bit. Uh, so, okay, so that's what, so that you might mix lower. The other reason, and that also covers the second reason too, is the mastering, which we just talked about. So one is for a headroom. The other is for, so you have headroom, so you have options when you're mixing and you can mix up a little bit. So you might shoot lower, you know, you mix it up a little bit. And then the other option, the other reason is this also makes you a lot more consistent volume wise and you're a lot more critical. Now you might be saying, well, let me finish the first thought. I don't know why I'm jumping around on thoughts. You, you'll be a lot more critical of your mix because you're listening to that, uh, at that level and you're trying to like, look at this. You remember, who cares what a meter says if it sounds good to you? At the same time, don't be fooled that just because it sounds louder that that is necessarily better. And we cover this in the critical listening series. So you want to go check that out. Uh, and make sure that like you're you're clear on your ability to judge what's going on here. Now we use peak meters and RMS meters. RMS meters are far more accurate for average loudness, so they're better to mix with to gauge how loud the track's going to be overall. Peak meters are important because you don't want to clip. And so you see here that we have this like peak hold option right here. And if you have like any of the isotope sw stuff, they come with a really cool metering suite. And so I'll use like Insight. But I also, I'll use the dB, the dB meter, but over here, so this, this value right here is sort of like, you could sort of look at this as RMS. I, I've never actually read it on what it actually is. I usually watch my peaks. So if you're mixing with RMS, which, and so I feel like mixing on RMS makes more sense on a console than it does in the digital domain. Because in digital, if you clip, it freaking sucks. Like it, you broke the rule. And there are also other sort of weird things that happen when you clip a channel strip versus when you clip the master. So we're not going to delve into that. Just when you're mixing, you're going to want to mix around there. Those are some of the ideas in the headroom. RMS is better for overall loudness, but digitally we use peaking because if you go over that, you're going to have an issue. The other thing you're going to run into is true peak. You want to get a meter that supports true peak. The isotope stuff does, but I don't know if you have the isotope stuff. So, oh, there's other, there's another free plugin. Um, M Audio, Melda Productions has a metering in their EQ. You can turn it on to do true, true peak. I don't have it in this list, but it's on this computer. And they have, a, they have a whole free suite of plugins. And in it, you can, you can use their meters on, I think, almost every plugin they have. And they have this thing called True Peak. True Peak means uh, it, it's really important. So you can have two samples next to each other, but the interpolated frequency that goes between them, the that goes through, can actually can actually bow between two max samples and give you something that upon conversion. So it's basically what's happening in your DAW and what happens when you convert it can be two separate things. So a True Peak meter will tell you the loudness of the signal when you convert it, and that is a really valuable thing. So when you convert it, maybe it goes above and it will actually clip when you get in the analog domain, even though it didn't say it was clipping in the digital domain. And so those are called, that's called inner sample peaking. And in that result, that's why it's viable to use a true peak meter to do this. But just so you know, I really like the fruity DB meter. <laughs> it's whatever. Like I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm going to mix to negative six and then I'll peak there. And I'll, I'll usually edge my way up a little bit. I'm thinking about moving my my average mixing level down to nine because of some of the ideas I just told you, because I feel like I could get my mixes to sound a lot cleaner. Now, this is going to sound really soft when you do it as well. So when you're mixing, you're going to turn your volume up, okay? So that the that negative six satisfies whatever you need to be satisfied about when you're mixing. So you turn your volume up and you're like, okay, sometimes you'll find a good reference track and play it. But remember, that thing's been mastered, so it's been made to sound freaking loud. So you're going you're gonna to want to make it so that, and their RMS value is going to be way high because of the mastering as well. So it might not be a good idea to use the master, but some people do. You, you play something you really like and you turn up your volume accordingly 
And that's the, that's the part that I'll do my creative process at. And sometimes when I'm mixing, you might use it. You'll turn it down so that it peaks at the level you want to mix to. And then you turn your volume up there and you're like, all right, that's the perceived. If you want to sound like that track, if you just want it to sound the way you want it to sound like, like what I mean to say is you want to set the level without having to plot some sort of an extra track, which I almost never plot an extra track unless I'm going for a specific sound. Then you just turn up the volume till negative six. Peaking at negative six sounds good to you. If like your kick drum is going to be your standard, use your kick drum. See, oh, does that sound good to me at negative six? And then make that all right. Pick the loudest thing that's going to be loud in your mix at that particular moment. Find out what that sounds like at whatever you want to peak at. So if it's negative nine. You select that, move your volume knob around, and you're good to go. So anyways, that's a little bit about the dB meter. Uh, well, about the what level you should mix to. That's why we use peak is because if you distort, it's no good. We want headroom. And just because you have a lot of headroom does not mean that you... And the headroom is the difference between your, your peaking level and your nominal level, the loudest you can go. And just because you have a good RMS or a good, uh, uh, not a good RMS, just because you have a lot of headroom does not mean that you've got a great crest factor. Because when you bring it all up, what's your crest factor within the signal itself? It's within the signal itself that the crest factor is determined. So, so like the, when I was explaining it, it was as if, in the last video, it was as if you were peaking at zero dB. But in reality, it's actually wherever your signal actually peaks in the softest point that your signal is. Because if you're going to make your signal peak at 0 dB, then that's going to be your crest factor. So if you have any questions, let me know. Subscribe and have a blessed day. Just feel the beat. Just feel the beat. Talk it up. Just feel the beat.